together. The title of this message is Marriage Begins with Love and is Sustained by Love. Amen? So I'm going to read the scriptures over you because just in these verses I'm going to be reading it tells you why I'm doing it. Ephesians verse 22 Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord for the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I am speaking concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're mindful that in Genesis, the very first institution that you established on earth was marriage between one man and one woman. It's still that same principle for us today, Father. Thank you for keeping your word for us tonight to our generation that we might gaze into it and that it might gaze into us. May these words that are spirit and life become spirit and life in us and spirit and life through us to those around us. Lord, we love your word. We ask you to bring it alive now. Help me to get out of the way. Holy Spirit, take over. Father, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Okay. Verses 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Now, unfortunately, I mean, the, that passage of scripture has caused a bit of consternation in the church today. And unfortunately, there's probably a pretty good reason for it. There are some men that have abused these passages of scripture, not understanding what it's all about. It's husbands submitting to wives and wives submitting to their husbands as their husbands are submitted to Christ. And so I know there's a lot of consternation, but we need to remember always when we're reading the word of God that the author of these verses is the Holy Spirit. It is God the creator. He is a God of order. And I found that I love order. If you look at my front lawn, I don't let a weed get started. I'm out there diving on it and pulling it out. The hard thing is that I'm downwind from a bunch of weed mongers, and so my lawn gets filled with weeds sometimes. But he's a God of order. And you know, I've had the privilege of looking through telescopes out into space and see the order out there. And I've had the privilege of looking through microscopes, electron microscopes, down to 200,000 times magnification. I looked at this, uh, the, the eye of a wasp. And at the different levels, every place you look, there was order, no chaos. Each level was ordered down to where we couldn't see it anymore. Because he's a God of order, everything is ordered, even the order for our marriage relationships. So um, he has boundless and endless wisdom, and I think we ought to trust him with that wisdom. My whole idea about marriage is that God didn't make a boat that wouldn't float. He meant it 
not to sink. And so he has given us principles to live by if we will just live by them and understand that his whole intention for us is good, nothing be good, and only good all the time. <clears throat> so look at Paul is not a chauvinist male when he tells us these things. He is speaking from the mouth of the Lord. He penned these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He never intended for men to put their wives under their thumb or under their hand and hold them down and keep them from being that, all cre that God created them to be. So a good, look at, I was in the Navy and I'm glad that the guys that built the boat built it to float. As I went through two typhoons while I was in there in the Gulf of Tonkin off of Vietnam, and I'll never forget it as long as I live, the waves were probably 20, 30, 40 feet high. My ship would go down in the valleys. The guys on the aircraft carrier said the waves were so big that we disappear down in the valley of the waves until we came up on the other side. The guys that built the boat built it to float. The guys that the, the God who created marriage created our marriage boat to float and not to sink. He knows what he's doing. We just have to follow the rules, right? So just let me tell you that what I'm talking about now is the order that Judy and I share together in our marriage. I don't have to say something to Judy like, you need to submit to my headship. She knows I'm submitted to Christ, and she knows that I love her, and she knows that I would never, on purpose, for any reason, do anything that hurt her in any way. So she has no problem in submitting to my leadership in the home. Look, we talk about every decision that needs to be made. We give input, we listen, we talk, we listen, we talk, but in the end, the decision is mine to make, and however it turns out, it's mine to bear. That's the way God ordered things. So, um, look, and I gotta tell you though, in that, most of the time the decisions came out good, but there were times when my decisions didn't come out so good, but my wonderful wife, Judy, never ever made me to feel like she felt like God gave her a bad husband or a foolish husband. She always encouraged me and respected me and was kind to me. Look at, she never made me feel like a failure as a husband. Now, although I do admit to all of you that I felt like a failure in those times when I made a poor decision, I felt like a failure and I felt like she got cheated to have me as a husband. But okay, enough said about those verses. Are we all clicking on, on eight cylinders now tonight? Okay. That, that's the, uh, the engine of love we're talking about here. So verses 26 through 20, 25 through 27 says this, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now look, as a man, and as a man of God, I believe I can call myself that these days, I've got to confess to you, those, that requirement from God is one huge requirement to be put on a man. And I confess to you that in and of myself, it's impossible for me to do that for my wife. I can't do it. I need to be filled with God's Word. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I need to let the Holy Spirit lead me in these things. But in and of myself, it would be extremely hard for me to live up to the requirements of those verses. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I have the Holy Spirit, and I have the Word of God abiding me. And I've got such a love for Judy that comes from my God through me to her that it's easy for me to do for her. But it's only under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's only by the Word of God, and it's only by the love of God in me and through me that I can do it. 
So I have endeavored, therefore, to keep these requirements, these commands, really they're commands. They're not the, they're, Paul isn't making suggestions from God about marriage. They're, these are commands. And so uh, it's not easy to live up to, but I've endeavored to keep them for Judy. And, and here's the way it works for me. It's simply a matter of me preferring her over me. It's that easy. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. It is preferring her over me. And do you know the irony of it is? It's almost that as though Judy and I are having a contest in who can prefer the other most over the other. I, um, you know, you, you have these, uh, these ministries within the church that you can take. And God gives them to you, and he gives you opportunity to serve him. And oftentimes, uh, like at feasts, I've been to feasts where people tried to take the high places and did take the high places. When Jesus said, take the low place, I never see anybody competing for the low place in the church. It should be that if I understand what the scripture is saying, we should all be rushing for the lowest place in the church rather than the highest place. And so in marriage, it's not unlike that. We should be seeking the lowest place rather than the highest place in serving one another. So if we're supposed to, as husbands, love our wives as Christ loves the church, we have to ask ourselves, well, how much does Jesus love his church? How much did he love his church before the church even ever existed? He went to a cross, died a terrible, horrible, agonizing death, not counting all the stuff that came just before that, the beatings, the scourging, the terrible things that you spit upon, blasphemies, everything that he endured, both emotionally and physically. He did that out of love. He did it. So how much does Jesus love his church? Enough to lay down his life for his church. So I've learned that means for me to lay down my life for Judy. Now in the world, somebody might call me a wuss. I don't even know what that means, but it's not, it's not a term of endearment, I assure you. Um, but in the church, laying down my life for Judy is an expectation of God. And so I do it out of love for him, out of love for his word, and out of love for my wife. I lay down my life for her. Why? And I said this earlier. Why would I do that? Well, first of all, God commands me to do it, and so I want to be obedient and keep his commands. But also because what I said earlier about a marriage being the smallest church on earth I want people to look at Mike and Judy Orlando's marriage as a mirror of how Jesus loves his church so that they can look at us and see how Jesus loves his church. And in a way, what we're showing the world is that our love for each other is saying, this is how Jesus loves us. This is how we love each other. Amen? I know Jesus loves her. He laid down his life for her as her husband then because this isn't the grand suggestion. It's a command. I must do the same. Verse 26. For the word of God cleanses his church and cleanses my wife with the washing of the water of the word. My take is that somehow, some way, God has built into his words the capacity for cleansing us. Now the blood cleanses us inside, but the washing of the water cleanses us as we go through this corrupt, immoral, dead and dying world, we get corruption on ourselves on the outside. His blood then becomes like you'll see the, the guys with their great big semis at a car wash and they're using the wand to hose off their mud flaps. Well, his word is like that. It hoses off the mud flaps of our lives so that we can walk clean before him like we want to. 
It's not that we're not clean on the inside, it's we get junk on us on the outside. So G, then Judy is being cleansed by the word of God through me. So here's what I would say. It looks like God's goal is a radiant church without spot or without blemish. Holy, radiant. My goal for God then is a radiant wife that is without spot or blemish, holy by God's Holy Spirit and by the word. Dear ones, it's often said, happy wife, happy life. As a husband, I can tell you that for absolute surety. Unhappy wife, unhappy life. I know too many people that have uh, unhappy lives because their wives aren't happy. But happy wife, happy life. No kidding. <laughs> In a sense it could be, we could just say this, we could make it a maxim. For me to love her and make her happy is her to love me and to make me happy. And that's how it works. Now I don't love her to make her happy. I love her because the love of God is in me and I love her because she's my wife and I love her because she's my best friend, my prayer partner and all the other things that a man could possibly ever ask from a woman. Like the psalmist, not the psalmist, the, man, the writer of the Proverbs, Proverbs 31 said, you excel them all. And she does. She excels them all. In my heart, she excels all women. So for me not to love her in a way is to commit love suicide in my own life. So in the end, loving my Judy is loving myself. Not to love my Judy is not to love myself. Now. You know, in Genesis it says that uh, for this cause a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That word joined means literally to be welded together in such a way that they can't be broken apart. Or I've got two paint sticks here that are glued together with Elmer's glue. You could not pull these sticks apart without them breaking. They will not come apart. And the glue line and the weld line on this piece of metal is a picture of our commitment that we made in marriage to stay together no matter what comes our way to let nothing, absolutely nothing, get in the way of our marriage relationship. That's what commitment looks like. That's what God wants for us. So I love my Judy and I'm glued to my Judy <coughs> And the only way I'm letting my Judy go is when God calls me home. So look at, if you picture those two pieces of metal or those two pieces of wood glued together, can you see how now we're one piece of metal and one piece of wood? So when I love Judy, I am loving myself, whether you picture it as the metal welded together or the sticks glued together. In the end, I am loving myself because we're now one. Loving her is loving me. Her loving me is loving her. Amen? Now, cherish means to protect and to care for someone lovingly. When I do that for Judy then, based on what I just showed you with these two pieces of metal and two pieces of wood, it's happening to me. At the same time, I cherish her, she is cherishing me. <clears throat> I got to tell you, I don't think there's a day that I wake up and don't thank God for Judy's slippers being beside mine under our bed. I cherish her. She is absolutely wonderful and I cherish her. So I'm ecstatically happy. I'm blessed by her and my her life and mine and how could I not therefore cherish her? 
She's the best. Verses 30 through 32, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I am speaking concerning Christ and the church. So just like those two pieces of metal are a picture of Judaism, our, our commitment in our marriage that we're now one instead of two, in the same way we're joined to God by Jesus Christ. So no, we're not no longer one, but we're two now. We're joined together. We've become one. We're one with one another and we're one with him. So our communion service teaches us that, right? Doesn't it? Isn't that when we take communion, we are remembering what he did for us. We are remembering how he gave his life for us, like we give our lives for our wives. We are remembering his love and commitment to us. And we're also seeing the picture then of this, this joining together of husband and wife on earth is what's to happen with Christ and his church on earth. Now we're one with him, we're one with the Father, we're one with the Holy Spirit, we're one with one another in our marriages and as the body of Christ. That's how it works. So if you picture then the two pieces of metal welded together is a picture of our oneness. If you also picture us being welded together to Jesus Christ, that's a picture of the church's oneness with him. Now, there's a wholeness between the man and the woman. There's a wholeness that comes to us from God. And the wholeness is a picture of oneness. And oneness is a picture of wholeness in our relationships. That's what wholeness is. It's oneness with God and oneness with each other. So this is a great mystery then, as the Apostle Paul said, Jesus sees the church as his bride and one with him. Our marriages on earth are to be a visible representation of that same mystery. So people can see it, actually visualize it and see it. Verse 33, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband's now for husband now verse 33a is a restating of what he said before about a man loving his wife as himself but verse 33b however adds a specific command to wives and it says this and let the wife see that she respect her husband Dear sisters, married, unmarried, if you don't know this, please consider it now. Husbands, by God's design, receive love from their, from their wives by the wives' respect. That's how husbands receive their love from their wives, by their respect. So. If you show respect for your husband, can you see that he will easily cherish you? These things are all interrelated. They're all tied together. They're all put together by a master designer and craftsman, our Lord. So, husbands receive love from their wives by their wives' respect for them. And when she does that, he cherishes her. Now here's something for us to consider because we're going to look at Revelation chapter 2. These verses were written to the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus was given this gift, this mystery, this understanding about what love is to look like in our marriages. Our relationship to God, the love that we have for Him, and the relationship in our marriages. So, 
they were entrusted with that and from them then that letter went out to the other churches of the seven churches that were part of that region there it went around like a circular thing but they were entrusted with that so um but something look at they started out so in love with jesus and then somewhere along the way something happened something happened and we'll see that when we look at Revelation chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Now, in just, look, here's the thing that we've got to learn from this. In just 20 to 25 years, they went with, from being the church that was entrusted with this secret, this mystery about love, to being a church that fell out of love with Jesus. And we're going to see that in a few minutes here as we read these verses. So I, it, to me, it's like a warning. It looks like if it could happen to this church at Ephesus and they were given this thing, it can happen in our marriages and that's what we want to consider. I take these scriptures, I apply them to my life. So, Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven. Again, I will read them over us for the washing of the water of the word as we heard in Ephesians chapter five. To the, change, the angel of the church of Ephesus, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Listen to this. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my namesake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So verse 1 then is clearly a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. His dictation is to John the Apostle, and John the Apostle is to give it to the angel of the church of Ephesus, which I believe is probably the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Verse 1 continued. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. This shows us that Jesus is in charge of and that he is also actively present in his churches. When we come here, he's not out there somewhere. He's here. He's right here, walking in our midst every time we meet. So, Clearly then he knows what's going on at all times. I can tell you this, in my own life, just in my own life, he knows what I'm thinking. He knows what I'm desiring. He knows what I'm wanting. He knows what I'm watching. He knows what I'm listening to. He knows what I'm touching. He knows it. He knows me inside and out. He knows his church inside and out. But that should be comforting because all we have to do is do what he teaches us to do, right? We don't have to fret or be anxious or anything like that. We just love him and, and obey him. Verses 2 and 3 clearly reveal that. So I said he knows what's going on at all times. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my namesake and have not become weary. Notice he commends them for their work, which is a beautiful thing. That's good to know. He sees what's going on. He sees what's wrong. He sees what's right. And so he's commending them for their works. Now, these are not works for them to earn salvation. They've already got salvation. These are works that demonstrate, at least at one time, their love for him. They hate evil. They are hardworking. Their action, their act, they test the actions of leaders by the scriptures. And they just keep, keep on keeping on for his namesake. But something terrible has happened in this church. 
that it was given to the oracles of God some 25 years earlier. So we can start walking right. We can walk straight and walk straight, but all of a sudden we lose sight of why we're walking right in the first place. We lose sight of why we serve, why we do the things that we do in the church, and so we can get caught up in doing works for the work's sake rather than being in love with Jesus, that being the whole motivation for why we we're working in the first place. So, um, so he doesn't. He commends them for what they did, but now we're going to hear a uh, a reprimand by him. Verse four. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Here's what happened, and it happens in our marriages the same way. When we start out, we are so in love. We are so on fire. I can remember the times that I couldn't stop thinking about Judy. And as I shared yesterday with the people that came, I mean, in those days, you, you had a landline, and we'd be talking, and we'd talk until we fell asleep, and the beep, 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 beep would wake us up. You know, I mean, just crazy. I'd wake up with dry drool running down my, <laughs> fell asleep. But we were so in love, that's the way it was. She'd walk into a room, my heart would do somersaults. You know, we were in love. But just like this church, what can happen in a marriage is that we get busy. Look at life comes at us a hundred miles an hour. You start having kids. You've both got jobs. Somebody gets sick. All kinds of things happen. You've got to take care of all kinds of daily routines and activities. And so sometimes you can get so busy with the life coming at you at 100 miles an hour that you forget why you even got into the relationship in the first place. Don't have anything to say across the table or sharing of facts rather than sharing of love. And life just happens that way. So um, what happened to them then was they started doing the works and they were doing the works great but they were doing it for the wrong motivation and it hurt their savior. And it can hurt a marriage relationship the same way. You start doing these things and pretty soon you forget why you were doing them in the first place. You did them because you love. Here's what I think. He does not want their service to him apart for the, from their love for him. He wants love to be the motivation for everything that they do for him. That means you got to hang out with each other. Say, Jesus, I, I wish I could stop and talk with you now. I wish I could read your word now. I wish I could pray now, but I got to get to work. I'm running late. And you get out on the freeway and then that gets swallowed up. You get to work, your boss is mad at you, you came in a little late, you haven't been doing a good job. And so what happens is then you start to lose that sense of what you were doing in the first place, which was loving your spouse. And it gets you. So we start out so in love with Jesus in the church and we can start out so in love with Jesus, with our spouses in our marriages and then that love gets lost through busyness. Some of no fault of our own. Just life deals you some hard blows. It really does. I've been there. I've lost jobs and had to work two jobs and not make as much money as I was making at the job I lost. So I've been out there, I know what that's like. And it can take you away from your wife, it can take you away from your children, it can take you away from your family. And you start forgetting why you were doing what you're doing in the first place. So what happened to the Ephesian church then can happen in our marriages. So it's, kind, it's like a warning. We have to just be really, really careful and stay on top of, make sure that we are very, very, very in much with our spouses. And, why we're that, and, and that's why we do what we do. So their excitement and their passion and the relationship that they had with Jesus waned. It just waned, it went away. Verse 
God meant for our marriages to be blessed. He meant for love to be the rule of our marriages, just like love is the rule of the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, just like love is his relationship to his church. Now listen, I could run maybe a 10 flat 100 yard dash when I was in high school, but there were guys that ran nine four and made me look like I was standing still when they went by me. Marriage is not a sprint. I became a long distance runner. I can run like the wind. For miles I could run and I did real good in cross country. Marriage is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And it's not some instantaneous thing that happens. Marriage is a journey. I have found out that marriage is a journey. Now look, I used to drive up to the high Sierras. I love to fish the lakes and the creeks and the rivers up there. And so what happened though was that I was so into getting there and getting my line in the water and catching fish, I missed everything there was to see and experience along the way. I didn't see a thing. I wanted to get to that fishing hole and start catching fish. And I missed what God had purpose for me along the way. Marriage is a journey. And you need to, as Joan said, enjoy the moment that God gives you. Live in the moment. Because we don't know if we got the next one. So she taught, and I think wisely, live in the moment. It's a beautiful thing. So I learned to do that. Now I don't have pedal to the metal. I go along and enjoy the journey, and it's wonderful. So just like the fishing trip, my marriage is a journey, and I enjoy. Look at, I'm getting older. I won't say that Judy is, but I'm getting older. Judy doesn't have wrinkles. I've been married to her for a long time. She has care lines. There's a big difference between wrinkles and care lines. She loves people. And she cares about people. And it weighs on her. But we're getting older. But we're getting older together. And we accept the changes. And we're enjoying the changes. And so we don't have, you know, uh, brisk walks along the beach. We now stroll along the beach. But we're hand in hand. The wind's blowing in our face. The sun's shining down on us. We've learned that marriage is a journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. If you think it's a sprint, you're going to be real disappointed. Because you're going to have to start sprinting again the next time, and the next time, and the next time, rather than just go along on the journey as God has ordained it to be. We just look, in our humanity, we just simply get busy. We just do. We don't even know what happened. We don't even real. It doesn't happen like one day we're so totally in love and involved with each other and the next day we don't even know who each other is. Like ships passing in the dark. It doesn't happen that way. It happens slowly over time. It gnaws away. It erodes away at the love and pretty soon there's less and less and less and less in the relationship. And so we miss out on what God had intended and planned for us in the first place, over busyness. Judy and I came from a church that we were out six nights a week normally and seven nights a week often. And all of a sudden we realized that we didn't have any time energy for our own relationship. We'd look at each other with longing eyes, unable to fulfill what our eyes and our hearts wanted to do because we were so stinking tired worn out from just serving. You know what I mean? And so we lost each other. And so what we had to do was slowly begin to cut back until we had time for each other. Then we could do that much service and ministry in the church. So, yes? So what keeps us from a love relationship with Jesus? is the same thing that can keep us from a love relationship in our marriages. Just over busyness. Just life coming at 100 miles an hour. Just life pedal to the metal. 
and it just gets lost. But it can be recouped, and that's what we're going to find out here in these next verses. So after his reprimanding, after his reprimanding them, this is what I love about him. Don't you hate a person that tells you you've done something wrong and, uh, and don't tell you how to fix it? You just fouled that up. You know, you get an F today. And they don't tell you what you did wrong. But Jesus isn't like that. After reprimanding them, he tells them how to get back in verse 5. How, to, how do I get my love back? He says this, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. To get back to their first love, he tells them and us in our marriages that there are three things they must do. They must remember, repent, and do. Remember what? From where you've fallen. He's saying, remember how you experienced each other's love when you first were in love. Do you remember those feelings? I can turn my heart back, close my eyes, and remember that experience vividly. I can actually feel it within myself. So he is telling us to turn our hearts, look back, and remember what it was like. How did you feel when you first fell in love? When you were first in love with each other? If you do what he is saying, then I understand probably the way we're engineered by him. If we do that, then by his design, the feelings of love will return to us and likewise we'll return to him with those same feelings of love that we started out with. Next, we're told to repent. Now, you know, with regard to the church, certainly Jesus doesn't need to repent of anything. He loves us perfectly. He loves us all the time the same way. But we might need to repent concerning him, and I have. I've fallen on my face and said, oh God, forgive me. But in a marriage, what I've discovered after all these years, and Wayne and Vern have been married quite a few more years than I have, but what I've learned is that we have to repent, and it's a two-way street. It's not usually one person that's failed in keeping the love alive in the marriage. There's two people in a marriage, and that can cause love to fail. So both parties have to repent to say, look at, I'm sorry for the coldness, I'm sorry for the love that's gotten lost, I want to get it back, do you want to get it back? Yes, I want to get it back. Well then, let's go for it together and get it back. Finally, his instruction to them is, and to us in our marriages, is do what you did at the beginning. What did you do at the beginning? Well, I, that's not hard for me. I wrote notes and put them on her windshield in the morning. I wrote on her mirror, I love you. I uh, left notes and did things, flowers, all kinds of things everywhere. And we dated. I mean, dating is just one of the most blessed things that I've ever experienced. We dated. And so we've had some of the best times dating. We really have. And we've had a lot of laughs dating too. And uh, so Judy and I, what we do to keep our love alive is we have a date night that belongs to us and nobody else. It's for us to refresh our love, to refresh our feelings, to talk about our needs, what's happening, what isn't happening, what would we like to see happening, where would we like to go, and so forth. We have a date night. And the only thing on this earth that can take that from us is a crisis in somebody we love. So that means somebody's in the hospital, they're on their deathbed, or somebody needs this, or somebody needs that. Then of course we'll give it up and just take it another day. But we have said to each other by our love that this date night we cherish, we hold on to, it's precious to us, and we're not going to let it go in any way, shape, or form. It belongs to us. So what we have here is not rocket science and the things that we've looked at together tonight. In any way, it's not rocket science. Our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, knows exactly how to fix what's wrong in His church with the love of His church. He knows exactly how to fix what's wrong with the love in our marriages. 
if we'll let him do it, we just have to follow his rules and guidelines. So I would just close with this. Marriage God's way is wonderful. And the things that I've shared here tonight aren't just about marriage. It's not just about Jesus loving the church and the church loving Jesus. It's about the church loving each other. And you guys are doing a great, great job at it. But we want to stay at it. We want to stay in love and not let anything come between it. Marriage God's way is wonderful. He says, remember, repent, and do the first works. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that, I mean, it looks like your first priority when you created mankind was marriage. It must be big on your list of important things, probably tops, Father. Love. You love each other. You love us. You want us to love each other. We want to love each other. We ask for Holy Spirit fullness. The fruit of the Holy Spirit it is written is love with joy, peace, long-suffering. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We want that, Father, in our relationship with you and our relationship with with each other and our relationship and our marriages. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And everyone says, Amen. Amen.